to say it? Okay. Good morning, church. I think. Uh, did you turn the Did you turn the switch on, Steve? Underneath. Good. Let's try this one more time. Good morning. Ooh, I was afraid that was going to happen. Sometimes you start turning stuff up back there. What's going on? And then it just goes all at once, you know? Hello. It's like playing with snowballs. You know, you get one going down the hill, and then by the bottom, it just, yeah, takes out a truck in the driveway or something. Um, it's great to see you guys. My name's Stephen. If we haven't met yet, I hope to meet you soon. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this service of St. Paul's. We're just glad that you're here. Uh, we hope that this morning you're, you're ready to gather for worship, because that's what we're here to do. Please take a moment and let us know you're here. Um, there's little slips like right in front of you. If you look in the chairs right in front of you, uh, you can find one of those, fill those out. Pa uh, when the offering plates get passed, like forever from now, it's way down the road. If you remember to just throw those in there, we would really appreciate that. Um, we hope that you're in a, in a prayerful mindset. I want to let you know Ramona once again is on the piano today. No organ, we're hoping next week, right? Maybe, maybe. You see, the organ's not just something you can, like, you can't really walk on those organ keys, you know, under there. You have to support your weight and, and push yourself on those keys because they're real gentle. And so after her surgery, she still can't quite do that. So and I, I can maybe pick her up and throw you into there, you know. We'll see. But So we'll be all piano this morning, but we are blessed and delighted that, to welcome you to this service. And we hope that you'll just enter into his spirit this morning as we gather in his house. Church, at this time, I invite you to stand as you're able. Our opening hymn this morning is You Are the Seed. Let us celebrate as we sing. You are the seed that will grow on and sprout. You're a star that will shine in the night. Yes, it's great. 
before you're seated, would you turn to those around you? Some of you guys know we're going to run over chairs to get to other folks. Would, would you greet them in the name of Christ before you're seated this morning? Good morning. Are we ready for the scripture? <laughs> All right. We have two today. I know, that's exciting, right? This one comes out of Mark 6, verses 7 through 13. Jesus called the twelve to him and sent them out in pairs. He gave them authority and power to deal with evil opposition. He sent them off with these instructions. Don't think you need a lot of extra equipment for this. You are the equipment. No special appeals for funds. Keep it simple. And no luxury ends. Get a modest place and be content there until you leave. If you're not welcomed, not listened to, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shrug your shoulders and be on your way. Then they were on the road. They preached with joyful urgency that life can be radically different. Right and left, they sent the demons packing. They brought wellness to the sick, anointing their bodies and healing their spirits. 
Our second scripture today comes out of Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 6. Listen to me, coastlands. Pay attention, peoples far away. The Lord called me before my birth, called my name when I was in my mother's womb. He made my mouth like a sharp sword and hid me in the shadows of God's own hand. He made me a sharpened arrow and concealed me in God's quiver, saying to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I show my glory. But I said, I have wearied myself in vain. I have used up my strength for nothing. Nevertheless, the Lord will grant me justice. My reward is with my God. And now the Lord has decided, the one who formed me from the womb as his servant, to restore Jacob to God, so that Israel might return to him. Moreover, I'm honored in the Lord's eyes. My God has become my strength. He said, it is not enough, since you are my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the survivors of Israel. Hence, I will also appoint you as a light to the nations, so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. In our Mark scripture, we may notice that they're sent out two by two. This happens a lot. We still see it today. But it's probably got roots in Deuteronomy. Whenever something happened, they would call for two witnesses or even three was better. Because there's something to be said for that level of trust when there's just one individual as opposed to more than one. How much can you trust someone who comes to you and tells you a story? Unless there's somebody there to back it up. In a different version of this, instead of saying you have all you need, it says... Don't carry bread or a bag or money. It actually tells them to leave things behind. And what this does is it's trying to indicate what their status is. They'd be considered itinerant preachers because there were other people that were out on holy missions at this time and they were traveling around and they would at least take bread and a begging bag with them. They had something to their name to ensure that they would be sustained. And Jesus is telling them, don't even take that. Because, see, at this time, it was a good thing to invite people into your home. Hospitality was seen as wonderful, especially to those on holy missions. Somebody like that shows up at your door, and you're like going, yes, come in. Can you imagine doing that now? Come stay with me, complete stranger. It doesn't even make sense to us. So the refusal to even hear their message if somebody's come up to them was a bigger deal. And it would require some sort of shoulder shrug or dusting your feet off, or what do we say now? You dust it off? I might, I'm too old to say that now, I think. But it's that visual reminder, that action of letting go. It's a little more than just walking away. There's a symbolic act. So Jesus is reminding them that you don't need anything. You don't need what these other people are taking with them. Hospitality is going to be enough. And if it's not, that's okay. Just shrug your shoulders and try again. In this, I came across a parable. It's called the parable of the ducks. It's not out of the Bible. I know you're surprised. But it's a parable told of a community of ducks, and they're waddling off to duck church one day to go see their duck preacher. They waddle into the duck sanctuary, and the service begins, and the duck preacher spoke with eloquence of how God had given them wings with which to fly. With which to fly. He pounds the pulpit with his beak and said, "With with these wings, there is nowhere we ducks cannot go. There's no God-given tasks we ducks cannot accomplish. With these wings, we no longer need to walk through life. We can soar high in the sky 
and he gets shouts of amen and quacking back, right, throughout the whole congregation. And the duck preacher concludes his message by exclaiming one more time, with these wings we can fly through life. We can fly. And all the ducks quacked and shouted amen in response, and they all loved the service. And every duck that was present commented on how wonderfully convicting the message was from their duck preacher. And then they waddled all the way home. (laughs) Why didn't they fly? Why didn't they fly? Is it because they weren't really convinced and they were trying to fit in? Is it because he never actually taught them how to fly, just told them that they could? It'll be great, let's give it a shot. Did they not fly because they were afraid to take the leap? How do most birds learn how to fly? They get kicked out of the nest, they fall. That sounds awful. The final act for Jesus is similar to our scripture today where he sends his disciples out to do the work on their own. And then they do this crazy thing where they go. (laughs) They'd spent time following him in his footsteps and building a community together. It was so much more than a simple message. And they had to take what they had learned and to spread it across the world. We are the spiritual descendants of the 12 disciples, chosen by Jesus for a purpose. We're the spiritual descendants of Paul, the great evangelist, and even of Jesus Christ himself, called to proclaim and to live out the good news that Christ has come. When in your life have you ever felt that familiar nudge from God to do something new? to do something different. Maybe there's that nudge on your life in this moment. If we're the heirs to the disciples and we're receiving these same instructions, and we're meant to be sharing God's words and actions and his name together alongside of one another, how can we emulate this. In reading this week, I came across this article of why churches don't grow, and there was, I'm going to say, nothing surprising. I found it more interesting is that it's not for a lack of desire to reach more people. You can walk into any church, and they all say, we'd love to have new, right? Right? They are all ready for that mission. It's not for a lack of prayer. Every church prays together. It's one of the easiest things we do. It's so natural to talk to God. It's not for a lack of love. Every community that is set together loves on each other. It is a natural way that we live together. The one I found interesting was it's not for a lack of facility. Growth can happen anywhere. There are churches across the globe that have more and that have way less, and none of it actually plays a factor in whether or not they're reaching new disciples. And then it goes on to give us this this list of these wonderful ways to reach out, and I'm very happy to report that I don't think we missed any, because I was a little worried. (laughs) But I think I came across one that was, I'm going to say, my favorite. I'm going to say my favorite, because what happens in a lot of churches is they never pass the barrier of the mom-and-pop supermarket, where mom-and-pop do everything, and move on to a corporation where they start to empower other individuals to help. And so what I start to notice as I look around myself and I look at some of the different things that we have going on, and how many of them are volunteer-led? It's not somebody on the paid staff that does this. It's somebody who's stepped up and said, I can take this. 
Pastor Monty and I don't lead any Sunday school classes. Have you noticed that? This last year, we went to uh, Cherokee Nation. And part of Gloria's job as missions director is a lot of people think that she leads all the missions. Well, she did the first year. And this past year, she empowered somebody else to take the reins, which is fantastic and wonderful because it gives us this opportunity to sit alongside and say, here's how we, here's how we do it. Now put your emphasis on it. What does it look like? So how do we work together as a church and as volunteers to answer these individual calls? To answer these individual calls? Because we are like the disciples. We're all equipped with different knowledge. I could say none of us have had the same experience, but when we talk about experience leading our lives... I don't mean just my individual experience is the best experience, because that's not true. I learned something from each individual experience in this room. I'm intended to learn from those around me, because everyone can present this, this perception of faith that they have of how they have seen Christ move in the world. And every story is unique. John Wesley was giving a talk, and he said it was advice to people called Methodists. I love how he names things, because I can easily find what he's talking about. It says this, If you walk by this rule, continually endeavoring to know, to love, and resemble, and obey the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ as the God of love, of pardoning mercy, if from this principle of loving, obedient faith, you carefully abstain from all evil and labor as you have opportunity to do good to all men, friends, and enemies, if lastly you unite together to encourage and help each other in thus working out your salvation, and for that end watch over one another in love, you are they who I mean, I mean by Methodists. There's this movement toward each other. And this word, each other, is actually from the Greek, and it's used 58 times in the New Testament. In Hebrews 10.25, it says, meet together and encourage each other. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 says to encourage each other. Romans 12.10 says, love each other like brothers and sisters. Galatians 6, 2, by helping each other with your troubles, you truly obey the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 25, care the same for each other. James 5, 16, pray for each other. Galatians 5, 13, serve each other with love. Colossians 3, 13, forgive each other. If we concentrate too much on eternal life, We'll forget that we're called to be participants in the kingdom of God. If we concentrate too much on eternal life, we forget about the community around us. So, is there a difference then between sharing our actions, our mission, and sharing the word of God with someone else? Is there a difference between mission and and evangelism. What really draws new disciples? How do we pass along this message? Is it when we build something new? Is it when we move things around in services? What actually works in our community? I think the word evangelism scares people sometimes. And I think it's because that there's been this cultural connotation that's put on it. That's not real. So let's think of it this way. Wooing God's children back to God's loving embrace. Wooing his children back. So in this relationship between mission and evangelism, mission is the body, and evangelism is at the heart of it. 
It continually beats. The body can move in different contexts. All around the globe, it interacts, it engages, it's constantly at work. And the dynamics of it, how you move, is largely determined by your setting, by where you are. And it determines how you respond. But it doesn't matter what body you have, you have a beating heart in it at all times. And it sends life-giving blood throughout the whole. It's what keeps it moving, what keeps it going. Because what happens if you remove the heart? The body dies. To separate evangelism from the mission leaves the mission lifeless. Isaiah 49, 6. This is what we read earlier. He said, It is not enough, since you are my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the survivors of Israel. Hence, I will also appoint you as a light to the nations, so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. It's answering the call. The ducks were afraid to fly, and we aren't quite sure why. Maybe there was a fear of taking that first initial leap. Maybe it's because they weren't taught how. And the way we engage each other is the way we learn. It's not dependent on one sole individual, but on the collective. So when I ask the question of mission or evangelism, what draws in new people, what creates new places for new people, you do. Every last one of you. Because when we separate our mission from our evangelism, there's no connection between Christ and the cultural context in which we live. No connection between Christ and our community in which the word is proclaimed, in which the good news is shared. So my question is, How can we empower you? How can we remove fears? How can we encourage you and lift you up? How can we prepare you in a way that makes sense for what you're thinking, for your heart, for your mind? John C. Maxwell, in his book, The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, says leadership is not about titles, positions, or flowcharts. It's about one life, influencing another. And even Jesus himself told us that we are the equipment. We're the whole toolkit. We have absolutely everything that we need. And this creating new places for new people is just a collaborative adventure. Each of us has a role to play, and we may wonder what it takes, but we don't go it alone. And working together, God gives us what we need for the task. And in Acts 13, 47, we hear an echo of Isaiah. For the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have set you out to be a light for the Gentiles, so you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And so today I'd like to bring you back to our doors that are behind me. We're starting up life groups, and in them there's no defining feature of what makes one group different than another. But also in them, you'll notice that we have sent people in pairs to work together. There'll be a host for each group and a leader for each group to share the burden. Our hosts take a moment to open their homes and invite people in. Our leaders take a moment to look at what they're going to ask that week and be prepared before everybody else. To answer questions like, what were your successes this week? And to set the example of how to answer. To lead the conversation through scripture. How do we talk about this? How do we unpack this? How can you take a moment to answer questions back? And so you're going to notice that Pastor Monty and I are both going to lead a group, but that's still three more doors. That's still five different hosts, because I now have a rug at my front door that says 
there's like a lot of children in here. My mom sent it to me. Love that woman. But it gives us that moment with each other to call on those 56 times in the New Testament that we're supposed to be together. And how wonderful is that? Will you please pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ability to learn together in community because we know that when we learn together, we grow together. We lose that fear of flying. Our hearts beat with a need to share your name and our bodies move in kind. And we take it out to our community of Raymoor and we take it out as far as we can travel into the places where we dare not speak your name. And so we pray as our Father taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Will you please join me in voice today as we bless our tithes and our offerings? Mighty ruler, teacher of all who are willing to grow, let us hear enough of your word to be astounded. Let us see as many of your deeds as will make us eager to join in outreach to people in need. Grant us enough of Christ's vision and compassion that our weakness may be useful to you in proclaiming your word, sharing your grace, and casting out demons. Amen. Since he faced his reality A life that could easily have never been led And lost in the tedium Afraid of what he's become Moving through life like he's already dead On his knees tonight He prays to find something more, more than sunrise, more than just living this life day to day, more than a sunrise, he gave his life so your life would be more than today. tries to please everyone, a list of things to be done. Faith takes a back seat, and so do her dreams. The kids and the mortgage and work every morning. She has lost sight of what life truly means through the tears tonight. She prays to find something more. sunrise more than just living this life day to day more than a sunrise he gave his life so your life would be more more than a sunrise more than just living this life day to day more than a sunrise he gave his life so your life would be more than today. My sin and my shame 
been washed away. He died to save a sinner like me. My sin and my shame, they've been washed away. He died to save a sinner like me. My sin and my shame, they've been washed away. He died to save a sinner like me. Your grace so amazing, you give my life meaning. Jesus, in you I'm alive. My life is more than a sunrise, more than just living this life day to day, more than a sunrise. He gave his life so your life would be more than today. life so your life would be more than today so. would you stand for our doxology God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. you'll please remain standing for our closing hymn.
God's people said. Amen. Amen. Before we have our blessing this morning, which you're going to do, I'm sure. Uh -huh. I just wanted to mention, Jacob, you're, you're leaving this week, right? Yeah, tomorrow. tomorrow, Jacob goes up to Iowa for college. We've watched him grow up since he was, I guess what my grandpa would say, was knee-high to a grasshopper. You ever heard that saying? <laughs> but Jacob's grown up in this church, and he's turned into a fine young man, so we want to wish him well. So keep him in your prayers, and pray for Brad and Linda, his folks, too, because that's a big yeah, transition. Are you guys, is it empty nester now, right? Is that right? Yeah, all right, okay. All right. <laughs> It'll be quiet for a while, I guess. So we wish you well, Jacob. Safe travels. Well, in light of that, you are the equipment. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. With my prayers, my presence, my gifts, my service, and a witness to your grace. Make my vow, my purpose, my life, my work before you all my days till I see. Thank you. 